Good evening and good afternoon to everyone uh, who, are, who is listening in and who, those who are be, going to be listening uh, to, to us afterwards. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to today's episode of Responding to the Pandemic Together, FIP's COVID-19 online program. Very pleased to be welcoming all of my panelists with us today who I'll be shortly introducing. Thank you so much for joining us and very happy to begin this really exciting discussion with you. You all. My name is Lina Bader. I am the FIP lead for Workforce Transformation and Development. I'm also the lead for the COVID-19 online program. Very, very pleased to be hosting uh, our guests and having you as well online. Just wanted to um, tell you very quickly about our online program. Since the pandemic, we have developed this uh, program of digital events focusing on COVID discussing all issues related to the pandemic and we'll be continuing to deliver these events throughout the year so please if you have any ideas on webinar uh, topics uh, or themes please email me at lena at fip.org and we'll be very happy to take those forward to plan an event together with you I also want to uh, draw your attention to our webpage uh, on the FIP site's FIP COVID-19 Information Hub, which actually hosts all of the information we have about COVID, as well as links to all of our previous digital events that you can um, access. We also have developed a new Facebook group earlier um, this year, COVID-19 and Pharmacy, where you can connect with thousands of pharmacists, pharmacy workers and healthcare professionals around the world to discuss, share uh, and talk about anything related to COVID or the pandemic uh, during these times. And uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, bits for you. This webinar is being recorded and is being live streamed on Facebook. Uh, the recording is freely available for everyone uh, and will also be uploaded on our website, which I just mentioned, as well as our YouTube channel. You may ask questions by typing them into the question uh, box, and I'll pick those up later for the panelists and I to discuss uh, and interact with you. Uh, finally, your feedback is very welcome about this event, so feel free to email us at webinars at fip.org if you have any feedback about how this event is running and any ideas for the future. So, um, really today's topic is a very, very important and imminent. As the coronavirus pandemic claims hundreds of thousands of lives across the globe, a parallel crisis of substandard and falsified, or SF, medical products, claiming to prevent, treat, detect, and even cure COVID-19 threatens to add to the growing death toll. Currently, with no safe and effective vaccines available, a vast window of opportunity has opened for criminals to exploit fearful populations by selling fake coronavirus medicines, test kits, disinfectants, masks, and other medical products for significant profit. Drug shortages caused by the crisis have created ideal conditions for SF or substandard and falsified medical products to fill the gap both online and offline. Very pleased today to have uh, a round of panelists to really explore SF issue across different perspectives. Uh, one is on the illicit sale of medicines uh, and medical products online. Another is about a case study from Rwanda and the perspective of frontline community pharmacists also to discuss the role of education, training, and advocacy in raising awareness uh, about this issue, the role of pharmaceutical industry in fighting um, SF medical products during the pandemic, and finally, the role of youth leadership in fighting this uh, fight together. So really, really excited to have this um, huge, uh, huge range of perspectives with my panelists today. And I'm now very pleased to introduce my panelists. We'll introduce them one by one and have a mini discussion with them uh, ahead of their presentations. I'm going to start with Mike. Mike. Mike is the executive director for the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacy in the EU. With over 30,000 fake pharmacy websites targeting Europe on any given day, this organization's mission is to enable patients to buy their medicines online safely, where it is legal to do so. With over 50 participants involving many key internet stakeholders, its aim is to produce concrete actions that will make a real difference and ultimately benefit the health of patients. 
The Alliance has a strong affiliation with global and uh, local organizations aimed to raise the awareness as well as advocate for greater governance of the internet to prevent illegal online activity in the field of falsified medicines. Uh, Mike, welcome. Mike, I have a question for you. As the executive director for the Alliance, uh, what, is, uh, what is the Alliance's main concerns with regards to substandard and falsified medical products during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic we're living through? Well, I think because we are, um, have uh, patient safety at the heart of all that we try to do, then clearly it's of great concern. Uh, and my presentation shows the extent of the problem uh, and how it is growing. Um, but I will also show a lot of good work that is being carried out by governments and law enforcement. Um, and I think as much as this is a terrible and challenging time that we're going through, I think the, the silver lining is most definitely the fact that governments around the world are finally really, really waking up to the fact that online platforms, websites, social media um, are not under control. And so we have misinformation and you will all be aware of the um, illegal product and fraudulent offerings. So let's hope that we can all work together and this particular uh, webinar, um, if we can make it uh, uh, a route to better collaboration and you've already used the word advocacy there are things happening in Europe and the US and around the world that if we come together and we put our name to wanting better internet governance so the infrastructure needs to be addressed properly then this is the time we can do it we need to seize this chance uh, and this will mean in the future the criminals who are taking over the internet and selling these false medicines, falsified medicines can be truly addressed. Thank you for that, Mike, and welcome. Really happy to have you and looking forward to your presentation. I'm very pleased to then um, introduce my next panelist, Maryam Jitha. Maryam is a final year pharmacy student at University College London and a visiting researcher at University of Toronto. She has a keen research interest in multi-stakeholder collaboration to improve pharmacy service delivery and its implications for employers, regulators and educators. As student co-lead for the UCL Fight the Fakes campaign, Mariam engages young people to take a lead in raising awareness of the dangers of SF medicines. She took up the role of Youth Internet Governance Forum Movement Ambassador, working with a global team who are collectively aiming to safeguard against fake online pharmacies and other cyber threats. Uh, Mariam is also a passionate gender equality advocate and contributor to the Royal Academy of Science and International Trust Girls in Science platform. Mariam, we are very honored to have you today. Thank you, Lena. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. What an impressive CV for um, some, uh, someone who is so young. Really inspiring. <laughs> Mariam, I have a very um, quick question for you before we begin um, with the presentations with everyone. Can you tell us what is UCL Fight the Fake's message for youth and pharmacy students around SF medical products and COVID-19? We're really curious. So I think to all our young people out there in the audience today, um, the message from UCL Fight the Fakes is, is simply um, don't underestimate your role. And um, young leadership cannot go into lockdown at this time of need, especially. So just get involved, whether this is calling out fake news on social media, using technology to spread key messages, volunteering or simply following government advice. Um, just be aware when you're online before you're buying any medicines or just reading any information online. So just that, yeah. That's um, really helpful, Mariam, and I'm sure you're going to be expanding on that uh, a little bit uh, more later today. Um, I'm also pleased to welcome Stan. Stan joined Novartis in January 2017 as Global Head of Anti-Counterfeiting. Novartis, of course, is a leading pharmaceutical multinational with three divisions, pharmaceuticals, oncology, and Sandoz. Stan is based in Basel, Switzerland, where he oversees the design and implementation of Novartis' strategy against counterfeit and falsified medicines. 
Uh, previously, Stan lived and worked in Hong Kong, Ho Chi Minh, and Dubai, undertaking a variety of regional IP and anti-counterfeiting roles, both in-house and in private practice. Um, Stan, really pleased to have you with us today. Thank you very much, Lina. Thank you for the invitation and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, a quick question for you, Stan, before we begin. What is your biggest concern around the rise of SF medical products during the pandemic as, of course, global head of anti-counterfeiting at Novartis? Uh, thank you. Well, it may sound obvious, but uh, the first one is nearly a, a moral concern, really. At the time of a pandemic, when it matters the most at a global level, you still see uh, criminal organization uh, being very reactive on leveraging on an opportunity to maximize a profit at the expense of uh, patient safety. Um, on also tarnishing the reputation of healthcare systems on the pharma industry as a whole. Um, that's bad news, definitely. And we've seen that throughout over the last few months, that's for sure. I'm also worried about the unprecedented risk uh, this situation has created uh, on the risk this has brought on specific categories of products that are currently uh, considered as possible treatments for COVID-19. And you know, there are a lot of clinical trials at the moment many possible treatments are being explored but then it brings a huge level of risk on these products at the moment with regards to the full range of falsified medicines and i will cover that in in a moment uh, as well um, on a medium longer term as well personally um, I'm also concerned about the situation that we will find ourselves in uh, at the time of the economic crisis this pandemic will bring inevitably because we're nearly there already as we as we all know unfortunately on economic crisis means a rise of substandard and falsified medicines inevitably as well and we know that uh, uh, and I think my co-panelists would, would know that very well so I'm concerned this is just going to get worse before it gets better uh, and we'll touch on that as well, uh, but I totally agree with my co-panelist, Mike, that's where you need public-private partnership and really take the, the extent of the issue we are faced with in, in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you for that, Stan, and I think it's important to be aware of the realities, however grim, of um, the pandemic on this. And I think you're touching on the um, impact of the economic crisis as well is going to be very important for us to hear. Thank you for that, Stan. Um, I'm pleased to go around to my next panelist, Flandry. Flandry Javier Rimana holds a bachelor's degree in pharmacy. He has more than seven years of experience as a healthcare professional in the pharmaceutical sector and leadership. He served as chief pharmacist in charge of importation of pharmaceutical products, medical consumables and equipment in Depot Pharmaceutique d'Emile Colline for a period of two years. His core role was to import quality medicines at affordable prices. Before the foundation of Rwanda's Community Pharmacists Union, he served as a pharmacist assistant in Unique Pharmacy as part-time pharmacist um, in mid serve Africa for two years. Currently, he is the president of the Rwanda Community Pharmacists Union, advisor to the Bureau of Nation National Pharmacy Council since 2016, as well as an a regional representative at the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. He is also chief pharmacist in charge of importation and quality assurance in Trust Pharma Lab and founder of CEO in Pharma Health Consultancy and Business Advisory. Flandre, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. And hello to everyone. <laughs> hello, back to you. Flandre, I have a question to you. Um, as the founder and president of the Rwandan Community Pharmacists Union, can you tell us how have frontline pharmacists responded to the issue of medicines quality in Rwanda, especially during the pandemic? Thank you very much. As um, the Rwanda Community Pharmacists Union, we have tried our best during this, this COVID, this, this period, just to, to make the availability of uh, medicines and uh, as well as uh, in during the, co the, the COVID-19, all, all pharmacies, has, uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't close the pharmacy. The pharmacists continue to work day to day, and you know that uh, it was a risk for pharmacists, but we tried our best to support the government and to support our people to continue getting the medicines. As you know, the pharmacist is an expert and he is, is a medication expert and the, prov uh, and the provider 
pharmacists are trying to respond quickly to patients. So for us, we continue to work because pharmacists can help to respond also for this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for that, Flandre. And I think uh, we cannot uh, ignore at all the role of frontline pharmacists. And I think uh, hearing more from you on uh, what's happening on the ground in Rwanda is going to be very important and complement these other perspectives from industry, um, advocacy groups, etc. So I think it's it's really really great, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you, Flandre. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce Oksana. Uh, Oksana Pizek is a senior teaching fellow and global engagement lead at the University College London, UCL, School of Pharmacy. And since 2015 has led the outbreak of infectious disease and global citizenship program, open course focusing on epidemics and pandemics. Throughout the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Oksana has been a regular contributor on BBC, BBC Five Live, Sky News, Channel 4, LBC, Manoto, and The Observer, amongst other channels. As the founder of the UCL Fight the Fakes campaign, the academic chapter, Oksana has been working with global partners to raise awareness around the growing global health threat of substandard and falsified medicines, SF. Oksana is a UK registered pharmacist uh, with experience across primary care, academia and public health. She is a fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy and her teaching and research interests lie in global public health. In 2017, Oksana was also appointed to the Board of Trustees of the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association as well as its Global Health Advisor. Oksana, welcome. Oksana, yes, we'd love to hear your voice. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me um, to speak about this, this very important issue, uh, along with panelists from uh, various regions of the world and, and different sectors. Excellent. Thank you, Oksana. Really a pleasure to have you. Oksana, I have a question for you. Um, as the founder of UCL Fight the Fakes and as, as a global pharmacy educator, why are education and advocacy efforts particularly, particularly important throughout the pandemics? pandemic? Well, to quote Nelson Mandela, uh, education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world. And currently we know that in this, uh, during this pandemic, Fear, disinformation, and other drivers are leading people to, towards unsafe uh, medicines and that criminals will continue to profit on this if knowledge and awareness uh, continues to be low, which historically it has been a neglected issue, and will remain in the shadows uh, of the internet and, and other um, platforms where these products are being sold. So if we are to look at the WHO prevention, detection, and response strategy, you can't have prevention without improved formal training and education of health workers. And then on the advocacy side, a population that is aware, first of all, the issue, because many people we'll speak to on the street won't know what a fake medicine is, and the steps they should take to protect themselves. And I'm really looking forward to all of the presentations today because I think we'll hear a lot of insight around, um, especially during pandemic period where people cannot or are trying to avoid going into, let's even pharmacies and purchasing medicines online that they may unwittingly then go towards um, websites that are uh, not uh, functioning in a legal way. Uh, and that can sell either um, falsified or completely illegal products. So uh, I look forward to discussing this uh, with people and, and getting their questions as well. Absolutely, Oksana. And there's so much to cover. And I think I'd like to encourage everyone listening to us to keep sending us their ideas. Uh, and we might even by the end of this decide that we might need to do another another part of this to continue the discussion because I think an hour won't be enough to cover uh, to cover all of the issues surrounding this. Um, well, what will happen now is we'll, we'll have the pleasure of listening to our panelists, hearing more about their perspectives um, and seeing some of their slides. We'll then, uh, we'll then enter into a Q&A um, discussion with them. So actually, we'll start with the end. Oksana, we'll start with you. Um, you now have the floor and screen all to you. Thank you.
So I'm not sure that I have the shared screen. Um, you want to try now? Here's your first slide. Okay, I'll maybe just uh, coordinate with you for slide changes. In that sure. Case. sure. Okay, great. Um, so if we look at the definitions themselves, we've, we've been talking about um, substandard falsified medical products. These are two very different issues that have different causes. Ultimately, however, the consequences can be the same in terms of uh, they can harm people, they can cause disease progression, they can cause disability, and in the worst case scenario, can even cause death. So while the root issues may be different, we can all agree that they both are a threat to human health. When we look about uh, at substandard medical products, these are sometimes referred to as out of specification, but they are authorized and they're created by legal manufacturers. Uh, there may be issues with good manufacturing proof, um, the good manufacturing processes, or uh, they may be damaged at some point along the supply chain. So inappropriate storage conditions, uh, etc. But they're, so they fail to meet their quality standards, they may be degraded, there may be not enough active pharmaceutical ingredient. However, the intent in this case is not criminal. And that's an important distinction to make. Falsified medical products, however, are deliberately fraudulent uh, and misrepresent the identity, composition, or source of this medicine. And falsified medical products can be run by very sophisticated uh, organized criminal groups that have uh, vast factories and uh, networks. Often they use um, existing routes for human trafficking and arms trafficking to also supply uh, falsified medical products. However, also, and we've had cases like this in the UK, it can be in single sole individual uh, with a pill presser in their basement creating um, completely fraudulent uh, medications that can be contaminated, uh, that can be toxic. Uh, and again, there is a significant profit to be made. This is why it is not a new problem. Uh, it is estimated that between 30 to even 200 billion uh, can be made uh, by uh, creating substandard and falsified, uh, or, or just the falsified medical uh, products themselves. And so there is a huge incentive also because when we look at the criminality or the, uh, the legislation around uh, jail time, fines, et cetera, they are actually higher for individuals who are trafficking or uh, illegally selling things like heroin versus selling falsified cancer medications. So there's a lot of work to be done in the area to recognize this. Now, previously, uh, the term was called SSFFC, which is a huge mouthful, substandard, spuriously, uh, spurious, falsely labeled, falsified counterfeit medicines. However, following the World Health Assembly in 2017, uh, member states agreed that uh, to simplify and to really focus on the public health issues themselves, uh, that they would be going forward using the terms of standard and falsified and uh, also for in, in their research reports and otherwise. Um, and there has been a, a lot of uh, confusion in the past around this. So, uh, the terminology may seem insignificant, but it's actually quite important from a public health perspective. The, the counterfeit element is, is more to do with trademark infringement um, and patent issues under the TRIPS agreement uh, than it is to do with uh, the access to medicines uh, and public health agenda. So as, as I had earlier mentioned, uh, substandard falsified medical products are not a new problem, but they do boom at times of crisis. So if we go back to the 17th century, if we look at the Great Plague, there were rampant amounts of quackery and people uh, selling uh, all sorts of different uh, treatments uh, that had uh, no effect uh, because people were 
uh, incredibly terrified of the Black Death. And um, we don't even have to look uh, after the Second World War, when there was a drug shortages around antibiotics like penicillin, people were also uh, un unable to um, access this. So many criminals then found that they could dilute the product or create a falsified version of it, adulterate it in order to uh, make profit off of it. So uh, again, this isn't just something that uh, is new during the coronavirus pandemic. There is a history of uh, when there is a stress on supply chain or other crisis that evo evoke fear, panic, uh, when people start to stockpile medications, we do see that this, this then um, becomes a greater problem. And since the WHO announced the pandemic March 11th, 2020, um, and, and other colleagues may elaborate on this, but um, Operation Pangea, which is the pharmaceutical crime fighting unit of Interpol, seized uh, up to 14 million US dollars of falsified uh, coronavirus associated products. So ranging from dis fake disinfectants to medications to vaccines, et cetera. So um, again, that a number is continuing to rise uh, in the absence of a safe and effective vaccine. Um, and we do recognize that uh, our technology is, is both our greatest asset and <laughs> in this case can be a, a significant problem in terms of verification. And this is why I believe that education is so important in order to, for health workers to be able to report uh, accurately and appropriately, um, and also for just the general public to be able to distinguish between something that is legitimate and illegitimate. The WHO estimates that one in 10 medicines worldwide, uh, or, or in low and middle income countries, sorry, in LMIC settings, is either substandard or falsified. So one of the two. Uh, this means that one in 10 times we gamble with human life. And in some settings, this statistic is actually significantly higher. We have to uh, look only to Malawi where um, about 88% of their anti-malarials were out of specification. So they were substandard products. Um, so this, this is certainly varies from region to region. And in the poorest settings with the highest amount of conflict uh, and the most frail supply chains, we see that the, the, there is the largest problem. I think one interesting thing about the virus itself is that it has shown us that we're all global citizens, uh, that uh, every single one of us, perhaps for the first time in history, has been affected uh, in the way that we are living now um, as a result of this pandemic. So it shows us how interconnected and, and globalized uh, our world is and that we cannot ignore problems that occur in, in one corner thinking that uh, we will be, uh, it has nothing to do with us. And uh, this is often positioned as a, as a global health security uh, issue. Um, and this is why in regions that we do have a financing issue around regulatory health systems, et cetera, we cannot leave it just to the national governments to tackle uh, these issues on by themselves. It really does take a coalition of um, actors across different uh, countries and sectors uh, to support those where the, the problem is the greatest because we have evidence that it will come back uh, into the supply chain uh, in high income countries as well. So it's very dangerous to ignore problems uh, that occur in LMIC settings. And I actually tying it back to coronavirus itself, uh, this is perhaps a perfect example to show uh, the knock on effect. So if we look at the next slide then, which um, highlights uh, some of the reports. So already there have been uh, falsified chloroquine. So chloroquine has had a lot of, as well as hydroxychloroquine, has had a lot of media attention um, following the US President Donald Trump's reference of it in, in frequent press conferences. Uh, following that uh, high profile attention on, on chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, uh, these were identified in 300 hospitals and pharmacies across the DRC, Cameroon, uh, Uganda, etc. So these uh, 
were identified by WHO and uh, systems have been addressed as, as a result of this. And the DRC in particular has challenges not only in fighting um, COVID-19, but there has been another outbreak of Ebola. So, um, and there are some conflicts along the borders. So incredible challenges. And there has been a history as well in terms of conspiracy theories uh, that, that make it very difficult uh, to tackle these challenges. And we see that it's not just something that is uh, localized to that area. Uh, in the US, we have had uh, protests around COVID-19 also uh, being presented as a conspiracy theory, which shows us that reactions to outbreaks are similar in, in every part of the world. Um, there are reports as well of uh, different types of products in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, with hydroxychloroquine increasing from $150 uh, per kilo for the API up to 1,000, which of course had knock-on effects in terms of um, people being able to uh, access the legitimate product. Up to 2 billion people worldwide lack access to essential medicines, which really creates a vacuum for substandard and falsified medicines to then enter. Uh, and when uh, drug shortages and stockpiling shoot up that price, that's when we see that patients, perhaps out of desperation, uh, move towards unofficial, unregulated channels, including the black market. Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, has also highlighted that we are fighting an infodemic, uh, not just the virus. And what he meant by that is that there's such an influx of false information, misinformation and disinformation, which are actually two distinct terms. Disinformation is when uh, it is intentionally put to obscure and obfuscate uh, the understanding of the population as to the, the cause of coronavirus or its existence in the first place, whereas misinformation is misunderstanding um, the science behind it. Um, and sadly, this led to 44, uh, these rumors that were spreading on social media, the misinformation around a, a, a preventative uh, therapy, uh, which actually ended up just being a toxic ethanol solution, led to 44 deaths uh, due to people trying to protect themselves. And Iran has been one of the most hard hit countries uh, with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so if we look at, to, the, to the next slide, uh, as I've already mentioned, it's highly lucrative, uh, and it also then uh, indirectly funds other criminal activities, including terrorism. And because of its difficulty in detecting the low awareness globally of the issue and the high profits associated with it, uh, it has sometimes been described as the perfect crime. However, some policy progress has been made with the Lome Initiative in Togo uh, just in 2019, uh, which was a big policy win in terms of criminalizing um, distribution of falsified medical products in a more harmonized way, uh, which uh, will hopefully eventually align with the UNODC, that's the UN uh, Office of Drug and Crime um, Convention on this issue. So we look to the next slide then. We have, uh, again, the prevention detection response strategy of the WHO. And I'm going to highlight here that at the very core is of prevention is really education and awareness. Uh, there are very few pharmacy curriculums worldwide that give medicines quality any attention. Um, part of my work uh, in starting UCL Fight the Fakes back in 2015 was to revamp the pharmacy curriculum to ensure uh, that all, every single one of our graduates on day one could identify uh, if there is a suspicious product, what they should do about it. In the UK, we have the MHRA um, uh, is our regulator and the yellow card system, but also to then make it routine for uh, pharmacists in their counseling uh, to, or in their medicine use reviews, to ask about where people are purchasing their medicines, and again, helping them to verify uh, purchasing medicines online in a safe way. Uh, so currently, if you speak to many pharmacists, pharmacy students, um, there is low uh, awareness on the issue itself, but what is even more important are what steps should then be taken. Uh, and that's how we will have a better 
understanding of the global burden is if people are reporting um, frequently. And this lack of reporting uh, really creates a black hole of knowledge about this issue. So interestingly, the WHO says that uh, health workers are, um, and pharmacists in particular, are not amongst the highest in detecting or reporting. Um, but even some patients are able to identify, uh, well, I, you know, they split their tablet and it crumbles in a, in a strange way. And that's enough to, to be flagging suspicion around uh, whether this is an authentic product or not. And that's, a, that's really the role of pharmacists uh, on the front line as educators, patients, to ensure that um, people are um, purchasing their medicines th through uh, safe channels. And in some, in some cases, this is not possible. And that is where the policy element around access to medicines is going to play an important role. But the important distinction to make is that this is not just an LMIC issue. In high income countries, there are reports of this as well, although it'll be more online and Mike will speak to that issue in more detail. Um, and so it, it is really through uh, healthcare workers as well uh, and everyone along that supply chain. So people who work in procurement to be vigilant about um, purchasing from um, manufacturers that are uh, meeting certain criteria, that needs to be, again, um, it, it, all along the supply chain to ensure that the, when the patients finally receive the med medicines in their hands, that the drug pedigree is safe. Um, public awareness and public awareness campaigns, I think uh, Fight the Fakes has done a, a fantastic job in uh, working along prevention, detection, and response with a variety of partners um, during, uh, if anyone listening here um, thinks that uh, in their country or in their region that there is not enough uh, to, uh, work being done, uh, then please do reach out uh, because uh, there are many opportunities uh, to collaborate with us on ensuring that this message is reaching everyone and, and that the appropriate educational support and training is occurring. And uh, currently, FIP Commonwealth Pharmacists Association, uh, and I've been on their, their working group as well as Lena, uh, are, are developing a pilot uh, with five African universities to um, help in, embed a formalized uh, curriculum on this particular issue. So that needs to, to again, uh, be rolled out on a wider scale uh, after the pilot. And there are some interesting uh, when we go to detection, a uh, training on this is an important element, especially as uh, newer forms of technology are being used. And I believe Flandry will be touching on uh, the types that they're using uh, in Rwanda. If we go to the next slide, um, these are just the, the pillars of UCL Fight the Fakes on education, research, public engagement, and policy change. And on the next slide, I have uh, some of our partners that we've worked together uh, in developing educational or academic chapters specifically. So we welcome New Giza University um, from Egypt, as well as King's College in London have their own, uh, and the Medical Institute in Warsaw. So we are growing, uh, and through the Farm Alliance, both University of North Carolina and Monash University have uh, youth groups uh, working to raise awareness on, uh, in their uh, specific pharmacy schools. If we look at uh, the next slide, which touches a little bit on the research agenda, um, at UCL, students have the opportunity to uh, conduct um, research on this as part of their MFARM project and um, look at some of the healthcare professionals' understanding and perspectives on uh, falsified antimicrobials uh, or, or any medications. And, and this is really important because uh, the research body uh, requires a, a lot more investigation. Uh, there have been limitations on methodology, sample sizes, and, and sampling techniques, as well as the confusing definitions over time. But there is a clear need for the education and the research to be married together to ensure that policy is informed in an um, appropriate way for uh, more coordinated action. As, as I've mentioned, uh, historically, uh, this has not had as much um, 
let's say, uh, support at a member state level because there are so many competing priorities. So a medicine's quality uh, certainly is something that um, sometimes can be uh, put down to, towards the bottom of the list. Uh, despite the fact that um, up to 169,000 children um, under the age of five have died uh, uh, from pneumonia that was linked to substandard and falsified antibiotics. Um, and these are statistics and sometimes people can dismiss them, but health and medicines are, are human. This is a human rights issue. And certainly um, we don't want to have the unintended consequence that people start to um, fear that or, or lack of trust in not only healthcare systems and, and medicines and, and turn to other forms um, if what you're turning to is supposed to help you, but instead harms you. Um, and so there are wider socioeconomic consequences as well in terms of um, people not being able to return to work and, and a lack of recourse for justice in those who have been um, victims of this crime. And that's one of the things that I believe UCL Fight the Fakes and uh, the wider Fight the Fakes group are really important in providing a platform for the voice of the victims, for their stories to be heard, so that it's not just overshadowed by one in 10 or X number of deaths due to these particular medicines. Um, so I would be very interested in hearing from the group, uh, the panelists, as well as uh, people who are dialing in, in terms of um, their ideas to improve how we are able to um, reach those that need them most in, in, in this particular situation. Uh, and with the coronavirus misinformation being such an issue, uh, I really do see that uh, the work of Fight the Fakes uh, is more important than ever in ensuring that people are protecting themselves from uh, fake uh, tests, fake uh, products. And in, in this time, it's very confusing. Many people are unable to find uh, legitimate sources of information. So even uh, earlier, there were in the UK, people were being fined for selling um, test kits that had not yet been approved by um, the government. And so that could then lead, and from a coronavirus uh, perspective, if someone gets a, a false negative, um, they may then not social distance, they may not um, take all the other precautions that are required uh, and go on to spread the disease. And it only takes one person to infect 59,000 people within 10 cycles. So fake tests and other things, uh, COVID-19 products that uh, can affect uh, individuals' behavior around a coronavirus would be incredibly important. So at the pillar, at the foundational element, I believe education and awareness is where it needs to start. And then concrete steps in terms of ensuring that we have tools, uh, the technology and the as, um, policy and legislative reform to then to be able to support countries in their efforts to keep their supply chain safe and so that people can have be confident uh, that the medicines they take will keep them in good health. And I think I've probably gone over time, so. <laughs> Uh, we can never have enough, Oksana, but thank you for that. And I think um, that distinctions between terminology was really, really important, really helpful, because we do tend to bundle those terms up, but they are really distinct. Also highlighting the issue of the infodemic is really crucial. That's a huge uh, dimension of COVID. Uh, but also it, it's really shocking to see how fast, um, we, you know, the pandemic just started a few weeks ago and already we are struggling with um, substandard and falsified medicines aimed at COVID in the market so it just goes to show how dangerous this is and how fast action is really needed um, really looking forward now to perhaps hearing from Mike I think um, about the digital black market and the issues facing online uh, pharmacy sales Mike I'm going to um, attempt to give you control and just give this a couple of seconds if it doesn't work I'm happy to coordinate but uh, Mike the floor and screen is yours 
Thank you very much indeed, Lena, and thank you, Oksana, for, for a great um, starting presentation. So I've just tried to click on the slide. Let's try again. Okay, that's great. Yes, it's working. So um, uh, this is my starting slide. Uh, thank you very much, Lena. I would like to thank everybody in FIP and the team for the invitation to join this important meeting. Thank you very much indeed. This is what I have been uh, asked to talk about, um, but uh, I, I think I would like to uh, ensure that I leave you with three messages and the key messages are as follows. And you'll probably think this is a bit strange, but the first message is we must stop the horse bolting. Just bear with me on that one. And the second one is DNA. And what does that stand for? It stands for domain name accountability. And the third message, is top level domain dot pharmacy and that i think is particularly applicable to potentially every country around the world so three key messages stop the horse bolting dna and top level domain name dot pharmacy so um i guess this is a very important slide because it it really highlights the fact that there is no simple solution to the problem that we have. The internet is a very complex ecosystem comprising many, many actors and players, and that's what makes it so difficult to control. But I'm very pleased to be able to impart some really interesting movements uh, I'm going to be a little bit US and European centric on this one, but what's happening in those two areas, I think, uh, have the opportunity to uh, influence other countries. And I'm sure within your own country, your governments are now thinking very hard as to how they're going to address this problem of uh, uh, the internet and falsified medicines. Uh, this has already been touched on. Um, I'm now going to move into some uh, NABP slides. Um, this has already been explained. We're talking about organized criminal networks that make vast amounts of money. Um, the first report I'd like just to mention, and all of these are referenced in my slide deck at the end, um, but this is an excellent report by Europol and it highlights the way um, they have been managing and monitoring the activities of criminals who have been, as has been said, very quick to exploit the fact that everybody is locked down, everybody's at home, there's a great opportunity to uh, go online much more often. And interestingly, they, uh, they uh, did a social media trend uh, looking at the Twitter trends. And you can see here how the blue blobs grow each month, um, clearly uh, coinciding. And this is a consolidation of uh, five European countries. Um, but uh, each of the blue blobs have coincided with peak incidences of uh, the COVID-19 a, a, a pandemic. This is interesting and picks up on the social media question. Um, yesterday in the Daily Telegraph, um, we had Nick Clegg writing an article and he was actually on the radio in the morning. He's the global affairs and communications uh, head of uh, Nick Clegg. This is a useful article, but I just draw your attention to the second stab point. Facebook now have 35,000 people supposedly looking after safety and security. They are beginning to work very closely with government, which is good, and uh, they claim they have reduced fake news by 50%. They've worked on 200 elections since the last US election, and so they believe that they're getting um, their platform more in order, which is a very good thing. Moving to the next slide, I would really recommend you have a look at this port. 
uh, this report. Uh, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy are very, acu are very active and uh, the report uh, goes into um, what's currently happening uh, in the US mainly and Canada and other places. But I draw your attention to the last two points in red. Many internet intermediaries are acting, shutting down fraudulent face, mask, vaccine and test sellers, which is good. But we still have this problem of illegal internet pharmacies and they continue largely unabated. And we need to address that. And we do have some solutions coming up. Um, and then very importantly, the NABP and your own pharmacy associations in your country are very strong and can advocate absolutely for these things. So implement long-term policy changes. Uh, second stab point, domain name registrars. They're the people that give out the domain names to your people, your consumers, your patients, and they need to be uh, more governed, uh, governed better. And then uh, registries and registrars should provide accurate non-anonymous registration information. And last but not least, search engines should flag dangerous or de-index known scam websites. Uh, and so the NABP is calling for this and you can call for it in your countries as well. We've gone through the medicines, Oksana did that very well, but again, within the report, it goes into uh, the chloroquines, the antibiotics like azithromycin um, and various other, uh, even diltiazin, furuzamide, et cetera, you know, diuretic are being, uh, if you like, advertised. Uh, this is very interesting. There is, this is a consolidation of four scam websites. The top left one, if you look closely, it says there's a mortality rate of 40%, 40%. So breeding fear into people. The next one down, they're using uh, uh, the president of the United States there to give it some credence. And the bottom right hand one is important because NAPP detected that many websites that are not yet in use are ready to be put into use. So it demonstrates the scale of the problem. And as Lena said, with 35,000 fake websites aimed at you and I at any moment in time, it's a real problem. So I'm now gonna move on to what the FDA have been doing. They have a quack hack operation, interestingly, and you can see from this slide, they've been doing lots of good things, warning letters, and they've sent hundreds of abuse complaints to domain name registrars and internet marketplace, who in most instances have voluntarily removed the identified postings. But there's a lot of registrars out there that don't do this and needs to be addressed. Now moving on to the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, part of home security. Uh, homeland security they have been shutting down thousands of fraudulent websites and um, also they continue to work alongside u.s customs and border protection to um, to apprehend uh, the uh, the false treatment kits homeopathic remedies and purported antiviral products and personal protective equipment um, this is on the ASOP Global website. I would encourage you to go to that. There is a wealth of information on that website. This was a little infogram, and I draw your attention to during March, 100,000 new domain names were registered containing terms like COVID, corona, and virus. And the last stab point, new domain names fitting these criteria are being registered and to register a, do, a, do, a domain name, a registrar has to issue it. And they're being issued at 1,000 per day, which shows the extent of the problem. Another governmental response, very interestingly, the US FDA and a part of the Department of Commerce has a 120 uh, uh, day pilot project with New Star, VeriSign and Public Interest Registry to coordinate on responses to registrants. They're the people that uh, uh, buy the domain names that don't appropriately respond to warning letters. So that's good. So again, governments 
are actually asking people who are involved in the internet to start doing much more. Um, and the last point, I think, I, again, relevant to everybody listening, um, we signed a letter along with 43 other stakeholders, uh, a letter asking the White House, Mike Pence, the vice president, to actually act on the need to uh, increase legislation and government internet governance. Uh, and that is happening. And Congress, for instance, I just yesterday, and I'll just read, the Department of Justice um, is going to update the uh, Communications Decency Act of 1996. This provides immunity to online platform from civil liability based on third party content. The Department of Justice has concluded that the time is ripe to realign the scope of Section 230 with the realities of the modern internet. Hurrah, it's at last beginning to happen. And so you in your countries need to make sure your governments have up-to-date, fit-for-purpose legislation to combat the scams on the internet. Moving to closer to home, then we've had a joint communication by these uh, government institutions to step up actions against disinformation, et cetera. And then now this for, for me speaking very parochially is incredibly important. Uh, the Digital Services Act has gone out to consultation. So the 650 million people in Europe can actually add to this consultation and it will ultimately update the e-commerce directive. And so it's a significant opportunity to complete the digital single market in a well-governed way. It will upgrade liability and safety rules for digital platforms. Now, we, the consultation period finishes in 8th of September, and this is where we have the DNA initiative. And, uh, and this is where, if you like, we have to stop the horse bolting because if you go right to the top of the internet and here we have the internet corporation of names and numbers they regulate the registries uh, they regulate the registrars who in turn should be giving us transparent information on the registrants these are the potential bad guys that buy thousands of domain names in one go and then of course at the bottom of the pyramid is consumers so if we can control the access to those people that are giving out the URLs that enable these websites to run, then we, if you like, are at the portal of the website uh, of the internet. And this is why we feel that uh, it's the best, one of the, one of the silver bullets. Here, for instance, we have given an award to .denmark.tk which is run by the private company Hostmaster. They now, when they are on board any customer, they have to pr prove who they are, their passport, the telephone number, the name of their office, etc. And you can see how the graph has reduced dramatically the activity of, of suspicious websites. And so this is one of our approaches we're going to take. We would like the Digital Services Act to address domain name accountability and should legally oblige registries and registrars to have and make available a transparent registrant database. So we require proof of identity. And this is the kind of thing that will be incorporated into the Digital Services Act. So it's the biggest thing in town for us at the moment. I can't not talk about dot pharmacy. And again, this applies to each and every country that has come online. I can sell the top level domain name and you will have heard of dot London, dot Paris, dot whatever. Well, they bought dot pharmacy and any pharmacy who wants to be accredited by NABP and use the suffix dot pharmacy, um, then you uh, pay a small amount of money, you are then registered, you are monitored and therefore moving forward, any consumer or patient knows if they go to a dot pharmacy top level domain name that will be an authentic pharmacy so for instance in germany they should really buy dot apotheque 
in France, they should really buy dot pharmacy ending in CIE. So it's a great initiative and it's there for governments to seize and to do something about it. So these are the uh, various uh, bodies that we, organizations that we work with very closely. And as Oksana has said, we really do need to step up the collaboration. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but we are working very closely with these bodies to do good things. And for instance, our uh, ASOC Global, we've, if you've like, taken their initiative about domain name accountability, DNA, and we, so there's no point in reinventing the wheel. They've done some great legal work there and we aim to follow suit. So my last slide is, um, yes, point one is absolutely essential. Uh, we're still supporting in Europe the falsified medicines directive. It's still not fully implemented in the hospital environment. This is a pedigree serialization whereby every single prescription pack in Europe has to have a serialized uh, number and a tamper evidence. Raising public awareness, we are involved with the Youth, Youth Internet Governance Forum and they have a, a series of 10 meetings uh, uh, of an hour long around the world that is happening at the moment. So again, rather like UCL fight the fakes and what um, uh, Mariam talked about, the youth is our future. They are going to pay, play a key role. We need to work closely with ASOC Global and the White House, as I've mentioned, and the DOT Pharmacy NABP program, again, is crucial. And we also contribute to OECD EU IPO observatory work. And I'm just going to flick quickly through the last slides. These are the key references which will become available to you. This is our website. It's got a massive amount of useful information with infographics uh, and how to raise awareness with people, what to buy, how to buy safely. Uh, the DOT Pharmacy Verified Scheme, the information I imparted here, uh, the uh, very good Europol uh, report, the NABP report, uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and this is the latest OEC re report, OECD report. So th thank you very much for listening. And please do take those three messages, um, which is we've got to stop the horse bolting before it gets out there. That's absolutely key. Uh, and of course, DNA is all important uh, as, as well. And the dot pharmacy top level domain name solution is another of those silver bullets. Thank you very much, Lena. I hope I didn't go over to time too much. Thank you very much, Mike. I think that was a really great and really good examples of the importance of intergovernmental uh, collaboration, but also interagency collaboration, and really importantly, how we must work with regulators at the national level to tackle the issue of digital services and technology. I think it's really, really great. Uh, thank you for showcasing the alliances, um, mechanisms and tactics for um, supporting countries across Europe and the USA. And I'm sure we have uh, participants with us today who can perhaps share examples from their countries on how um, safe online pharmacies are, are being um, uh, assured really. Um, I'm going to move on to my next uh, panelist, Flandry. Uh, Flandry, um, you're going to be telling me when to move your slides. Very happy to help you with this today. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for FIP, for inviting me for this presentation. And if, thank you for the webinar, because it's very, really interesting for us. So when I, uh, next, next please. So as you know, everywhere in the world, uh, the, the COVID-19 is uh, everywhere. So for us in Rwanda, the COVID-19 have started in, on 20th, on 14th March. 2020 and uh, for my presentation I'm, I'm going to, to just to summarize what can pharmacists can do during this COVID-19. So when we look at uh, firstly what pharmacists can do and um, for us in, in Rwanda the pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare provider in Rwanda even, as, even also across the world. Pharmacists can provide essential patient care services during the unprecedented crisis. 
the pharmacist help the patient and the population to cope with this pandemic. When, but when you look at uh, the scope of pharmacy, and especially in Rwanda, you see that uh, there is a gap. But uh, I think uh, it is uh, everywhere in the world. You can see in the scope of pharmacy there is a, a need of, of uh, there is a need of to, re, re, to revise the law and policies uh, so that a pharmacist can do more than what he is doing currently. There is uh, also an increase of access uh, to pharmacists, adult training and curriculum to develop trends. So. Next, please. So as a, a medication expert and, provi and providers, pharmacists can manage medication, identify telepathic needs and alternatives, can do tests also. But when you, see, you look at uh, what he's doing currently, uh, when I'm in the case of one, you see that the pharmacist can do testing. But uh, when you look at the training pharmacist has, Pharmacists can do training. I mean, can do testing for COVID-19. It, it can also uh, do treatment when it is it is uh, available. Pharmacists can do uh, can do counseling of patients, compounding drugs that are in shortage and more, performing rapid test for COVID-19 once available. Pharmacists are also accessible and can respond to address patient care needs through telehealth and telepharmacy. But currently, when you look at what he is doing, you see that there is a shortage of, uh, there is a gap of what his pharmacists are doing. So that's why we are requesting, uh, as uh, my, as uh, like said, there is a need of global collaboration to revise those policies and what the pharmacists are doing. I know that, uh, FIP has um, uh, this system of advocacy. Mm -hmm. So, but when we look on the next slide, you see that um, uh, the pharmacist response to COVID-19 pandemic, when you see during lockdown, there is, uh, when you look at on this, the, the screen, there is uh, this uh, graphic. You see that, you see that uh, in center, there is a pharmacist. Well, when you look at the importation of medicine in, in case of Africa or Rwanda, I think everywhere in the world, you see that there is an import, importation and exportation. You see, you found the pharmacies there, community pharmacies, district pharmacies, hospital pharmacies, end users for patients. There is also availability of pharmacies, COVID-19 centers, and the, uh, those uh, policy uh, makers, especially for those uh, bodies, uh, regulatory bodies, you, you can find also the pharmacy. You see that the pharmacy is in the center. During this period of COVID-19, pharmacists are more exposed. But when you see what the pharmacy they are doing, is uh, there is a gap what can do. So all, for us in the case of Rwanda, all premises were open during this pandemic. But uh, next, pray. next, next please. Next, please. So for us, uh, in the case of, come back, please. So for us, in the case of, of, of Rwanda, you see that the import, importation continued uh, and the exportation continued as usual. So there, is, there was not a shortage of, of, of medicines. Measures have, have been taken, allowed the community and the supply to, and so, community of supply and the supply of medicine to be continued as usual. There is uh, 86 new companies have authorized to manufacture personal protective, protective uh, equipment and hand sanitizers. Different guidelines have been drafted and published by the government, professional bodies, councils, and the associ uh, association. When you look at on our website, we have tried to develop or to, to, to guide our community pharmacists how they can prevent themselves and how they can continue preventing uh, the, the, the pharmacy users. When you look at uh, on the next, on a, the next slide, please, you can see that uh, different images have been taken and uh, 
pharmacists contributed for just sanitizing of the population about the preventive measures, proper way of wearing the mask, importance of washing hands, social distancing. So all of the, those measures, pharmacists have been contributed to continue educating pharmacy users how they can prevent themselves and how can keep preventing the, the, their relatives. When you look at on the next slide, uh, ways of getting medicines during COVID-19 in the case of Rwanda, uh, the government have helped a lot to, use, uh, to, to, to help the population to get medicine as usual. Uh, for example, you know that uh, the drone, we, uh, during um, uh, when it is um, current, normally the drones was used to, to, to deliver, to supply the brats, but during uh, COVID-19, the government uh, uh, support the use of drones to deliver the medicines to vulnerable or NCDs patients. And there is also different softwares which is online. For example, for this software is called Ishida. Is online when you can search on Google can find it. So any patient can order a medicine where he is or she is and he gets the medicine in short, in, short, in short time. Next, please. So the access to pharmacy services, how you can, you can just start thinking uh, how, the, how the population was getting the medicine during the lockdown. But for us, as I say, during uh, COVID-19, during the lockdown, the, the pharmacists continued working as usual. So the, the pharmacies were, was, were, were, were open as usual. The, the, anyone who is sick was going to buy the medicine physically. And, um, but those who has not uh, the, uh, the chance to go to, to pharmacies, they was using uh, technology, as I said, the software online or just uh, ordering and get it through drones. And there is also use of, uh, use of uh, different technologies. Uh, I may say also Kasha, we have also Kasha. So, but uh, there is uh, a big, a big uh, things everyone can think about. There is a leftover medicine, medicines. Everyone one was worried about what about the medicine the patients or the population has in their homes. So that's why uh, on the next slide we will see that uh, the Rwanda community pharmacists, they tried to, to, to make a campaign through social medias. So when you look at all this, it's complying with pandemic. So everywhere in the community pharmacy or wholesale pharmacies, we have adopted the, the preventive measures where uh, the patient was able to call the pharmacist to, to be able to deliver the medicine at their home. There is also e-payment. Currently, we are using e-payment to prevent just the hand-to-hand the hand, hand -hand money because it's the one way that can spread the COVID-19. So for us, currently, we are using technology e-payment where we are using Momo Pay. So it's a um, mobile money payment where someone can transfer the money from his mobile money, mobile phone. We are using also Visa card. Currently, there is no pharmacy who are getting money in hands. There is also availability of mandatory hand washing san, 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 sanitation. So for example, Kanda Jirukarabe is uh, where patients comes in the and um, push by hands in the in the, the button and the water comes without touching on the the the, the, the pipeline. So this is kind of kind of is made in Rwanda. Pharmacists have been taken to be able to support the government to prevent the spread of COVID COVID-19. Next, next please. So response from Rwanda Community Pharmacists Union to
think we may have lost Flandry there. So the RSUQ collaborated with the one day GH to be able to identify and report the South Saturday and the Hello? Yes, Flandry. We are, we are working struggling. with the collaboration with Rwanda FU. We can Hello? hear you now. We can hear you now. Please continue. Yes, yes. Okay, thank, okay, thank you. Currently, RSQ is working in collaboration with Rwanda FDA to report, to report the substandard and satisfied medicines. So we are working also in, part, uh, in collaboration with uh, the Rwanda Standard Bureau to be able to get uh, uh, the report from the suspected products. So our community pharmacists, we have the WhatsApp group where, where everyone who has a suspected product, they can easily send the message or they can easily uh, report those suspected products to Rwanda FDA. And we are lucky to have all staff of Rwanda FDA to our WhatsApp group. So, a part of this reporting, we support also the Rwanda FDA for spreading the, the reports to the population. We assist also Rwanda FDA spreading the measures taken and the guidelines, uh, guidelines drafted to our members and to the population. So provision of accurate information to the population. So we did uh, a lot I may say that uh, each pharmacist, where he is coming from, in a district, uh, just in a district, or in a hospital, in a, their group from the their member, or their where their classmates, and so on, they have different groups. So for all all information we visit, we are helping to, to 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 spread it. And the RSP also has um, did different webinars. Customizing email. Next, please. Next, please. So, for ex this is an example of recorded medicine and hand sanitizer from the market. When you look at on this bottle, you can see this bottle that is uh, uh, is is made that is made in Rwanda, but the the factory is not uh, normally uh, highlighted. You can see the factory. And you can see the reboring is totally different to the 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 guidelines Rwanda FDA have been uh, uh, have been published, and those are different medicines Rwanda FDA have been recorded from the market. Next, please. So those are also uh, different examples and the measures have been taken by Rwanda FDA. Those are hand sanitizers uh, made by. Uh, a factory, but uh, when you see this uh, hand sanitizer, um, you can't see if it is falsified or if it is substandard. But when you are using it, you come to raise it on on hands. So those are the pharmacists who have been reported this, and the Rwanda FDA have already contributed and they take different measures as you seen on the screen. Next, please. Uh, as I said, as I said before, uh, there is a concern, or there is a concern during lockdown uh, about the ref leftover med medication. When you look at uh, the ne next slide, you can see that uh, one other CPU in collaboration with four uh, different uh, uh, media houses, we have we have published the kind of campaign to explain the danger of using leftover medications. And the best way to get support by calling, pharmac calling pharmacists, doctors, or approaching community health workers. We are lucky in Rwanda we have community health workers that assist, that assist the population to get their medication or to get their assistance in, in emergency. Those community health workers, they support the health system. They, they are well trained to support the health, the health system. When there is a patient from anywhere, they can approach the community health workers and get, uh, get help. 
uh, we did this because during lockdown there is uh, a difficulty of getting road public transport. There was uh, fearing to get out from from their houses because you, you remember that in the beginning every person was fearing about this COVID-19. But uh, later the population comes to be familiar with this one. We are lucky currently to have everyone is a uh, is uh, understanding about this uh, COVID-19. And uh, another main cause it was the feeling that, that unused medication can help them. So we have contributed a lot to explain the danger of using this uh, unused medication. You know everyone that uh, when there is, uh, for example, a silap can develop, uh, uh, can develop microbes, can develop uh, different, uh, it can, when it is open for a long period, can cause another diseases. That's why everyone was worried about these, uh, these unused medication, the patient keeping their homes, what they can do during COVID-19. And the, another support we got from the government, the government helped the, the population to get local, to get transport when someone is feeling, uh, is feeling not good. So next, please. So this is a, a newspaper we published the the the, the campaign was heading uh, the title of what should you do with unused medicines? Once you get time, you can consult this news news uh, news uh, paper. You will find the different uh, different uh, highlights we did during this campaign. Next, next please. So as conclusion, as I said before, we urge policymakers to include or authorize pharmacists in testing, interpreting, and counseling patients on test results, initiating treatment, and counseling patients when treatment are available, and ensuring the appropriate legal and regulatory authority support pharmacists' call to action to provide these essential patient care. Another conclusion, at this time we, of need, we need recognition across the globe for pharmacists. If we remember, there is a different, a new, a different um, publication I saw where uh, all authorities are recognizing doctors and nurses, but they ignore the contribution of pharmacists for this prevention of COVID-19. Pharmacists are contributing a lot in the industry, in the community in the supply chain, and the, in, the, in the community services, but they are not recognizing their contribution. That's why we, we call all policymakers to recognize pharmacists across the globe. At this time of, of needs, uh, we need recognition also uh, to use, we need to, to use their training, expertise, and the knowledge to test and treat patients. Different countries, pharmacists, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not doing testing. They're not in doing immunization in their pharmacies. So we need the advocates on this so that pharmacists can use their knowledge to, to help the population. Entire health care collaboration is much needed by right? substandard, substandard products. When you look at uh, in the case of Rwanda, so our, our population, they can become and they come uh, slowly to understand the medication. Some cases, some reports we are getting it from the patient and the users. When, so we need entire collaboration to be able to, to fight the substandard and the falsified medicine. FIB shall announce its global advocacy for pharmacists. I may, I, I may come again for this because uh, uh, we, we need your support. We need to just to show what pharmacists can do to be able to support the, 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 the patients, to, to support the country, to support the, 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 the population. RSQ is working closely with the Rwanda FDA, Rwanda Biomedical Center, and the Minister of Health 
to keep pharmacists up to date. So, yes. but we need also the source of information to our pharmacists. Thank Next, you. Please. So, those are references when you, you need to check again for more information, you can visit those websites. Thank you, Landry. So, thank you very much. <sighs> thank you. I'm afraid I'm going to have to hurry everybody along because we are going a little bit over time. I know there's a lot to cover, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to definitely see what we're going to do with all the questions coming in, so everybody please keep them coming and then we probably will need to plan a follow-up uh, event just to answer the questions because we, we don't really have time. But I'll move along to Stan. Stan, thank you so much for um, being with us today and waiting and we're really looking forward to your presentation. I'm just gonna hand over remote control to you now. Um, if any problems, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to coordinate that. Thank you very much, Lina. Um... Let me make sure this is working and I appreciate we're running a bit out of time. So I'll try to expedite the presentation, but let's see first if I can move the slides, which it seems I'm not able to do. Lina, I cannot hear you, but just to tell you, yeah. it doesn't seem to be working. Or oh, um, if you could try again, maybe. I'll move them for you, Stan. Okay, well, next slide, please. Okay, so I started answering some of the questions and apologies because I realize there is a lot of interest, which is great. So uh, I'm sure with the panelists, we can definitely commit to, to respond to as many questions as we can, if not now, at least after the um, uh, after this uh, workshop or webinar. Um, here, uh, just very briefly, you know the context, everybody knows it. My co-panelist already presented quite a bit on all the recent operations from law enforcement, be it online, offline, at border post. So uh, I propose not to say anything additional to this and perhaps we can move to the next slide because I think the context, everybody understands it's high level of risk. On this particular slide, uh, Oksana also explained quite a bit about substandard and falsified medicines. If you could just allow me, uh, an additional clarification as to what we mean exactly by falsified medicines, because I think that's interesting to differentiate between the categories. So counterfeits, again, is not manufactured by the pharma industry, as simple as that. We have no take into the process. Criminal organization who manufacture in the basement or illegal manufacturers anywhere. Uh, medicines, I wouldn't call these medicines anywhere. The vast majority of what we tested had no active ingredient, um, had very uh, harmful substances, chemicals. I won't give you the full list, but we tested that for years. On 90% of these cases, it was a dramatic outcome for the patient. Uh, serious harm or death, absolutely certain of that. And we have tested really thousands of samples throughout the years. But then also falsified medicine is a more complex category because you have theft, so stolen medicines, stolen from or supply chain or the supply chain of the public sector. And that's very important. Um, and then they are being resold in different countries through illegal supply chain channels as well. They can be linked to a third issue, which is tampered expired medicines. That's a big problem. Um, I'll give you the example of one of our malaria products. We have Coartem, most of you would probably know, especially in Africa. And there were issues of uh, expired Coartem that were recovered by criminal organizations on being tempered, meaning they would change the expiry date and put them back on the market as well. And sometimes some of this would be stolen, of course. So, you know, it's all starting coming together. And then finally, illegal diversion, where you take one product intended for a market and you move it to a different market. The issue here is... is there is a patient safety impact. It's less critical, obviously, compared to counterfeits. But again, they could still be uh, they could still be expired products. That happens on a regular basis. The uh, indications are in different languages. So for patient, there could be a risk as well. There could be mistakes made with dosage. Uh, but the most important point are good distribution practices. Don't expect criminal organizations who engage into illegal diversion to invest into temperature control means uh, on nice shipments of the pro They don't, they don't. So regularly then we test products on the market and they lose the benefit of the API because you know it was too hot or whatever were the conditions. 
So all of this, you're looking at a package where criminal organizations, they couldn't care less about what it is they have. We have raided criminal organizations. They had all of this in their warehouse. Counterfeits they were manufacturing, stolen, tampered, expired, illegally diverted medicines. It doesn't matter what it is they make money with. Next slide, please. So what were what has been a response from the pharma industry perspective in light of COVID-19? Well, first of all, because we had quite a number of products uh, which were part of, which are still are part of clinical trials for COVID-19. Everybody knows about hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin. I'm not going to comment as to whether they're going to be good or not for treatment. That's really not the point here today. What I mean is irrespective of the outcome, they have been very highly exposed to risk of counterfeiting, theft, illegal diversion, you name it. So we have also other products like Jacavi and Ilaris in clinical trials. It doesn't matter. We had to bring a response to make sure we were managing the supply chain security. So intelligence, you know, you prioritize the products which are top of the list in light of this COVID-19 context. And we had quite a few in our portfolio, which before were nobody's concern, to be honest with you. And all of a sudden, they're top of the list. We had to double our capacities for online monitoring and enforcement. We leverage on data analytics as well to understand how we were impacted and to be very reactive. And that had to be done quickly. We had to expand our security features on products on secondary packaging. We have overt and covered security features on packaging. And we had to quickly expand on some of them who were not necessarily covered at the time. We had to enhance supply chain security, and I'll, I'll show you in a, in a second really what this looked like for some of our products as well. On updating, uh, updating spectrometric data as well, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you exactly why we did that. Uh, and then we had to engage with a lot of stakeholders, law enforcement, health authorities, because we are the ones who know about our products. They don't necessarily know. We can't expect police to know about all these uh, medicines as well on how to make a, a difference or at least uh, suspect what could be falsified. So there we had a lot of engagements, virtual, uh, but that proved to be pretty effective as well. Uh, and we had a lot of functions working all together. But I'll just give you a few examples of this in the next four slides we have. Uh, and you will see that's a fairly short presentation. So next slide, please. So first of all, how are we organized to respond to such things? Well, first of all, we have a, a structured program to tackle falsified medicines at Novartis. It's going to the top of the company, uh, the executive committee of Novartis on what we call particularly the trust and reputation committee. We report into them on they are the ones governing or operations for against falsified medicines. I have the privilege to lead what we call uh, anti-counterfeiting working group, ACWG. 15 functions working together, very cross-functional. Um, it's everyone from global health, corporate responsibility, legal communication, security, which I'm from, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, on on you can't uh, as well. So a lot of functions really helping on that agenda, really. Also because the program is really embedded in the strategy for Novartis. So it's part of the annual reporting. We have a report called Novartis in Society. You could find it online. If you want to look at the 2019 report, page 42, I'll make it easy for you. You will see a full account of what it is we're doing against falsified medicines. And you will see there is a, a lot of stuff. There is some great stuff on initiative. Unfortunately, I don't have the time today to go through all of this but please it's, it's a one pager but it's quite impactful um just to tell you what it is we're doing also we have embedded this into a risk strategy the risk of falsified medicines is one of the three emerging risks we have in the novelty strategy imagine we are a hundred thousand people in the company we have uh, shortlisted three emerging risk and falsified is one of them. So we take that pretty seriously as you can imagine. And then we're also contributing to things like the access to medicine index, you know, the Bill and Medida Gains Foundation. So we commit to share a lot of information for this index notably with regards to what we do against falsified medicines. So we held ourselves accountable um, to, to the public sector externally as well. Next slide, please. Prevention, what are we doing? 
securing our supply chain. First of all, we have to look at internally before uh, externally how we are impacted by criminal organizations. First, we have to make sure that what we manufacture reaches patients. And so for COVID-19, for products which were really high risk in light of the COVID-19 uh, situation, we had to literally enhance the supply chain security. So at warehouse level, uh, at transiting level as well from warehouse, uh, manufacturing side to warehouse, on when we were shipping out um, to uh, the different sites for global dispatch as well. We equipped the shipments also with state-of-the-art technology like GPS tracking, for instance, uh, and then monitoring through a global security operation center 24 seven as well. So as you can see that that was taken pretty seriously as well uh, at our end. Uh, next slide, please. Prevention still. How do we detect falsified medicines? Well, we need technology for that. Um, I worked for different industries in the past. With a naked eye, you could say most likely whether the product would be fake or not. Or you could say that for maybe uh, garments, you know, bags, or you name it. Medicines, in 90% of the cases, visual inspection is fairly unlikely to give you a determination. And I can promise you that we've been at that for years. Uh, sometimes, I would say you get lucky and you have spelling mistakes on the box or it looks really dodgy. But counterfeiters have, have got really good at that. And as I said, now they mix also sometimes genuine packaging and inside you have a fake medicine. So how do you go about that? It happens. So we have technology. So very briefly, we have scanners where we can scan the secondary packaging where we have overt uncovered security features. It's a great system we have and we have a network of uh, verifiers across the world to do that. And right now we are moving to mobile enabled technology to do exactly the same with mobile phones. Well, that's pretty cool. Second one, um, we have what we call toolkits, which are mobile laboratories near infrared, vibrational spectroscopy, and you name it. I won't go through the whole details. That could be a long explanation, but that's a very expensive piece of technology we have in a luggage dispatch across the world where we can respond to law enforcement and health authorities requests wherever they are in relation to our portfolio of uh, medicines as well. And that's great because it's very forensic. The reports, we can, we can use them in court as well. It's very detailed. And then we have a pilot in the pipeline that's going to be, a, it's been already a bumpy road, it's going to be a complex one, but we are very determined to localize detection of falsified medicines, bring that to the countries on where it matters the most, Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, with cloud-based uh, fast technology as well. So what you're looking at here, Authentic Field by Novartis, is vibrational spectroscopy. Basically what it does, you just take the pill, in the blister or you take the vial, you put it on the device you see, you test it through your mobile phone, you operate the tool with the mobile phone and within a minute you have a response whether it's your product or whether it's not based on spectral fingerprints libraries we have built as well. Bear with us, it's a bumpy road as I said, it's very complex, it looks simple, it's very complex but we're super motivated with these projects and we, we're really keen on bringing this to the countries as well. Next slide please. On um, this is a footprint we have. So the, um, on the three spectrometric toolkit, these are the mobile laboratories I described to you. We have one covering, covering the Americas, we have one covering uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa, and one covering uh, Asia as well. That doesn't look like much. I won't share with you the price of what these mobile, laboratory, mobile laboratories cost. It's absolutely huge but it's a great technology, but it's enough. We can travel with it. Or we can send samples to these different locations. So that's great as well. We have labs also uh, supporting us in this effort. Uh, we don't have so many labs because you know, we have to be careful with good manufacturing practices. We can't bring falsified medicines into the places where we manufacture our products. That would be an issue. So we, we just need to select these labs carefully. You can see the proof verifiers with the scanners. We have about a community of 250 people across the world at Novartis. And right now we only have 50 devices. It's a pilot phase of this Authentifield by Novartis uh, vibrational spectroscopy uh, that we're implementing as well. So we, we're building a network at a global scale to be able to detect faster falsified medicines and respond to lo local uh, authorities' requests. Next slide, please. 
Enforcement. Oh. That, that could be a very long list of examples, really. It's, uh, so just in light of COVID-19, fair to say, the focus for us has been really uh, leveraging on the collaboration with international law enforcement. Interpol, Europol, World Customs Organizations, the FBI, HSI as well in some uh, prominent countries uh, as well where law enforcement is very dedicated to this. We have responded to every single request at country level for capacity building, you name it. We are part of every single operation that is focusing on falsified medicines. We, we, we've been out there really. We had to put on hold every other investigation we had because of the COVID-19 lockdown. So like everyone else, we've been impacted for investigation purpose. So we reshifted resources to every single request from law enforcement uh, out there. And there's been a lot of seizures, really. As you can see here, the numbers are staggering. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but that's millions or tens of millions of units seized of falsified medicines. Uh, it, it, it's just never ending. Hundreds of arrests as well on all of these COVID-19 related treatments being fake COVID-19 related treatments or the ones that are being pushed. I think Mike mentioned about hydroxychloroquine, you know, it hasn't been approved yet. So we have to be very careful with this. Uh, and there are a lot of scams out there as well. So we had cases notably in the US for hydroxychloroquine. Uh, just to name uh, to name one. So that was very important and we maintain that effort as well. Next slide, please. And finally, and it will be my last slide, that's probably the most important one though, it's about stakeholder engagement. What it is we can do out there. So I'll start with the right hand side, public awareness. It's very important. We're part of some awareness campaigns. Fight the Fakes was mentioned by my co-panelists as well. So I won't drill too much into this, but it's a very important one. So we're keen on that. There was recently the World Attack on a Feeling Day. So we were a part of this as well to raise awareness. Any opportunity is just good, you know, on social media or through uh, workshop webinars, you name it. So it's really important to raise public awareness on the dangers of falsified medicines. Be careful, particularly when you buy online. And I think Mike really had a very good presentation in relation to this. It's particularly important, the, the, the threat at the moment because of the lockdown situation has really shifted online big time. And this is keeping us busy as well in terms of monitoring. Uh, so that's very important public awareness. Policy and advocacy, I'll go on the left middle. Critical, we need better laws, obviously in certain countries which are not equipped with proper laws to combat falsified medicines. So we are engaging with a number of uh, associations but also non-governmental uh, entities like the OECD as well on the policy and advocacy agendas as well. Uh, there are a number of key players out there. I won't mention them all. It doesn't matter. What is important is really to focus on promoting harmonized better laws to combat falsified medicines, like the Medicrime, Medicrime Convention. If you are interested, Medicrime Convention is definitely a good example to start with uh, for that. But we don't only need good laws, we need resources at a country level. You need political will. I know a lot of countries who have great laws, but nothing's happening. There's no political will, and there are no resources at health authorities on policy level to do something about it. So that's very important too. Uh, and you need the public sector, but you need the private sector to be involved. We have a role to play. We also have a responsibility and we mean to do something about it as well. So to be a voice in, in, in this policy and advocacy segment, I would say. And finally, capacity building. That's you today. I was thinking when we started this uh, earlier on, this uh, workshop, I was like, is this more awareness today or is this more capacity building? But most of you are, professionals really in the in the healthcare system so it's very much capacity building you have a role to play um, if you suspect falsified medicines to be out there you know whatever context i could mention a few but again to make it simple Again, the duty to report to local health authorities uh, to respond to a previous question maybe report that to also WHO if it's related to an Novartis medicine, you can reach out to us 
uh, there are ways to do so as well. So really engaging with us so that bringing attention in your country about the issue you're being faced with as well. But also for us to engage on a more regular basis, really. Thank you again for the invitation. We'd like to engage with the community uh, of pharmacists uh, particularly, but really by extension, anyone very, very open-minded. We need to do more of that. That's very important. And from the questions I see in the chat, there is a lot of appetite here. So I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, hopefully, we can still have a bit of time for Q&A, and if not, we'll really strive to respond to your questions. Otherwise, reach out to us, please. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that, Stan. And I could argue that we have engaged in all of these multiple fronts today, but, but I agree, capacity building was very core. Um, we do have one more panelist to go, and I think we'll have to wrap up the session. There are lots of questions coming in, so it's going to be impossible for us to go through them, but we will follow up with the questions and share them with the audience. And I note that Mike has to go, and of course, he must have another Zoom. Um, Mike, would you like to say maybe one more message um, to everyone uh, before you go. Just that I'm here to help um, advocacy, you know, change things at the, the highest level is absolutely possible. And the pharmacy associations normally are those that take the most interest in say a TLD top level domain name like dot pharmacy. Clearly where you, where the country speaks English, then dot pharmacy is available. It may translate. But where it doesn't, then ICANN has a second tranche of top level domain names, I think, which will be for sale in about two years. Uh, so it's the right time to start planning now for such a useful tool, because if everybody knows in your country, and that's another issue, how to get that message out. If they go to an authenticated website, you cut out the criminals. But I've really enjoyed today and I'm sorry. I, I have responded to a number of questions. I'm very happy to continue to do that. And I'm sure Lena and the team would also uh, be doing that uh, um, and devising a best way of getting back to you. Thank you, Lena. Thank you very much, Mike. Really pleasure to have you. Um, thank you and good day to you. We'll last few more minutes with Mariam, and I think it's really timely to end uh, with the perspective of youth, our future, um, to help us tackle this issue. Uh, Mariam, I'm gonna also hand over the floor to you and uh, let me know if you run into any issues. Floor is yours, Mariam. Thank you, Lena. So for the next bit, I would just like to appeal to all of our young people in the audience here today. So our pharmacy students, our pre-registration pharmacists, and our pharmacists on the front line as well, and really talk about where young people can take a lead in minimizing the impact of um, SF medicines and the infodemic. So this slide here is sort of the areas where young people can take a lead. Um, and they're summarized here as a list of priorities. So first and foremost, we would like to have some young internet leaders. So calling out fake news, using technology to spread accurate messages. So for example, the Youth Internet Governance Forum movement that um, Oksana of course and Mike is supporting fully rely on youth ambassadors to hold local meetings in their respective countries and use their social media reach to spread accurate information. And secondly, with regards to research and awareness, I think this is the most important point here. Um, our young people um, should stay up to date with changing developments, you know, have a look at the SF drug alerts, um, you know, just raise awareness, learning how to identify fake news and getting in touch with experts on the issue if they're unsure. So, for example, with the, um, the anti-vaccine movement, um, the study of a thousand people in, in New York, which is also reported in the BMJ, said that only 53% would actually have the vaccine should it become available. And this is completely due to the lack of awareness um, of identifying fake news. And when you have a research and awareness and you have the will to research more, especially in a quickly changing environment, this prevents movements like the anti-vaccine movement, which is completely based on um, misinformation, um, which was um, talked a lot about today. And the next point, I think, is information sharing and education. So Oksana talked a lot about education, and um, I, I second that. So, you know, using young people can use their platform to educate their following, educate their circle. So their friends, their families, their social media followers, so for example, UCL Fight the Fakes have been doing um, Instagram lives and releasing short videos along with IPSF. 
to enlighten their followers um, using the platform that we have. And this kind of youth-led information sharing, we, we want to see a lot more of. And I think it's something that young people can really take a lead on. And I think the next point is um, to urge young people to, you know, join in with the campaign and join these organizations. So we have the YIGF movement, we have the IPSF, we have UCL Fight the Fakes as well. Um, and these are all student-led organizations and they allow young people to, you know, have that leading voice in educating. So UCL Fight the Fakes is completely student-led. Um, pharmacy students at other universities like King's College London have recently mobilized a student organization in, in you know, um, in the current situation of the pandemic. It's, it's more relevant than ever before this issue. Um, and similarly, just joining IPSF who um, represent pharmacists and pharmacy students like myself um, and do their own series of webinars and online campaigns as well. So I think my final point here um, would be engaging with policymakers as well. Young people can really take a lead on that as well. You know, with signing petitions, writing emails to MPs here in the UK, voicing concerns, sort of asking questions. Um, for example, our pre-reg pharmacists and pharmacy students have been actively speaking out for PPE in the UK, um, actively speaking out for regular testing. And um, IPSF have released a statement as well, calling for pharmacists expanded you know, um, responsibilities, uh, mental health and emotional support, um, and speak about issues that are affecting them. And the SF medicines crisis is no different from those issues um, and requires similar action to raise the priority level of this um, issue with our policy makers. So a lot of the points I've mentioned here actually align with the UCL fights the fakes, um, four pillars that Oksana mentioned earlier. So research, education, um, public engagement and policy change. So could you change the slide please, Lena? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, so the next slide is simply to bring to everyone's attention why engaging the youth in particular is extremely important. So the power of um, young people's enthusiasm and engagement is extremely valuable for awareness raising efforts of the infodemic. So as we know, the theories have spread almost as fast as the coronavirus itself. For example, chloroquine is a proven cure or children are immune or 5G has caused the virus. Um, and the enthusiasm of our young people can be harnessed to help spread awareness, spread awareness that this is a growing problem, spread awareness that misinformation is a growing problem. And also, I think young people know and have experience of what their needs are. Um, so the youth are best positioned to speak about the issues and demand answers to questions that are affecting them at this difficult time. So a lot of young people are concerned about SFs. Um, and it's a global health issue, of course. So for example, um, the New Zealand's Prime Minister has been holding press conferences for younger people to answer their specific questions. And I think that's an excellent way to, for policymakers to really get young people involved. And also engaging the youth, um, I think, is also important to sort of employ their creativity and employ their talents. So, for example, youth entrepreneurs in the tech sector are developing mobile authentication service, different types of scanners. I know Flandry uh, mentioned a lot about technology in the sector. And these all have the potential to uncover some really novel solutions. And the novel nature of this virus really calls for thinking outside the box and working together in, um, as experts um, in partnership with young people though. And because in a lot of cases, the technology has been developed, but it just needs the, um, sort of the right moving parts um, and the right, right people to work together uh, with our young people um, to adopt the technology or the rollout um, and to really be part of the solution. And I think another reason why youth engagement is important is because young people are arguably most affected and will live with the lasting socioeconomic consequences of substandard and falsified medicine circulating. So according to a new United Nations plan to address um, COVID-19, young people are some of the most affected um, by, for example, the post-pandemic recession. And fake medicines infiltration into our supply chains can have consequences that last generations. 
Um, we all know that substandard falsified medicines seek entry when global health systems are at their most vulnerable. And we are in a, in a vulnerable state not right now with a, with a global pandemic. And if SF medicines sort of seep into supply chains right now, this can last generations, the impact lasts generations. And I think the most important point here is that we're already seeing the power of youth leadership um, through individual acts or through collective action. Um, youth led movements are really acting on an unprecedented scale. So youth are mobilizing communities to protect themselves and are supporting governments and health workers as well. So for example, we have our young activists who are working to fulfill the needs of their own communities around the world. So whether this is our pre-registration pharmacists stepping up or the medical and nursing students being fast tracked um, into serving on the front line. Um, and they're not only treating, but also educating the patients in their care um, with up-to-date accurate information. Um, and another example is um, sort of the, the medical doctor based in Benin who has organized a tweet chat which is essentially a mass literacy program to spread good information and myth bust for their followers. Um, and they've started a hashtag with up to 90,000 participants, um, which, and now I think they're even on their way to design an app. So th these kind of efforts um, through social media, um, even though remotely, um, are really, really important. Um, and our young people are leading this um, to really spread accurate information. So I think, um, my last point here is that young people must realize that they have a critical part in fighting the infodemic. Um, knowing that this virus is a spread, uh, is, is a threat to people, to livelihoods um, and to stability. And the, often the questions that um, are asked is what does this youth role look like? Um, and to give some examples, this, this role um, involves sort of educating our peers, as well as our general public about the issue of counterfeit medicines um, through our universities and, and their global partners. So, you know, expanding that circle, um, we can really take a lead in spreading the word as far as possible. So another, another way is um, engaging in research um, specific to COVID related SFs. Oksana mentioned um, a really good um, study um, that is, it was based at um, UCL by a UCL alumni student and, and Oksana who led on that. And, you know, engaging, you, we have these opportunities to reach out to our own universities um, for research studentships on this area, for example. I mean, I know a lot of summer placements are being cancelled for young people, but they can still do a lot remotely to contribute using, using our own online platforms. We can educate our following, our families, um, our friends, like I mentioned before, and really just take a lead on calling out fake medicines and, and calling out misinformation and, um, and also take it one step further and educate people on how to identify fake online pharmacies or fake news um, like, you know, just sharing simple tips, like a general rule of thumb when you're reading anything online, just, you know, stop and think, um, pay attention to quality, um, be aware of emotional posts, um, consider biases, just ask an expert. Um, and these are just simple tips that we can share um, as young people to really, um, you know, educate um, the public and engage the public. So next slide, please. Um, and finally, I think it's important to highlight um, how the youth can have their voices heard on this issue. So um, it's an issue that's affecting us. Um, we should speak about it, but how? So for example, through um, social media. So we have grown up with these online platforms and we use this to connect and, and share um, our views. And we can use this tool to raise awareness, um, to get our stories heard of the impact of um, SF medicines on us or on our families. Um, another way is through joining a campaign or mobilizing an organization, um, because that shared concern can sort of amplify our voice. Um, and th that's a really important, like sort of, for the, sort of the um, why IGF movement um, have started rely on youth hashtag. So, you know, all of things like that, um, we can really, you know, contribute to that. Um, and thirdly, I think calling on policymakers and those in position to enact change, um, to acknowledge the issue and raise the priority level of this issue. So this can be done through petitions, reports, articles, 
um, you know, letters, emails, actually even whatnot. Um, and for example, our Fight the Fakes um, statement to COVID-19 has called on all global health partners to raise awareness of the issue. And I think the next one's a really, really interesting one. So there's young, young reporters. So an interesting platform that's available um, for our youth is Voices of Youth by UNICEF, um, which is a really great forum for young people to, you know, gain um, information, um, you know, build their skills. So I think the participants, uh, more than half of them are actually girls. Um, and now they lead radio shows, they write articles for newspapers, they shoot videos on social media. And it's just really great. And it's just so proud to see. Um, and UNICEF actually have their own training programs where they're discussing the impact of rumors. They're discussing the impact of um, the role that young people can play in combating false information to keep their communities safe. And um, as inf misinformation about COVID-19 has spread, um, these uh, budding journalists, um, their new skills have become more valuable than, and, than ever before. So I think that's a really good forum to, you know, to uh, raise your attention to. And I think most importantly, um, you know, you can do something on a smaller scale too. So if you're, if you're worried about the issue, um, a lot of young people are just getting your voice heard by reaching out to your local support system. So your teachers, your universities, um, any social media platforms, you can always reach out to UCL Fight the Fakes. Um, you can reach out to our panelists here um, and sort of your mentors, your um, managers if you're working. And you can do this via newsletters, articles, you know, um, through the web website of the organization you're affiliated to, um, or just emails to share your thoughts and, and speak about what's affecting you. And I think my final, final point here is that um, we are already seeing these points in action. So in fact, the youth are amongst the, the most active and in global responses. And not only are they on the front lines, um, as health workers, but they're also advancing um, health and safety in their own roles, wh whether they are researchers, whether they're activists, innovators, or communicators. Um, and for this reason, I think it's important that we all must commit um, to ensure that these youth voices are part of the solutions and they're not missed out. Um, and some youth specific prov provisions are, you know, um, come, into, come into action. So key messages, um, the next slide. Um, so firstly, to our young people, we can play our part as young people and um, we are needed more than ever before. Um, we're, in a, we're in a vulnerable state right now, um, but not all is bad because it's, it's a way for, for all of us to come together and really reassess things. And I think we're a vital stakeholder um, and we can work together with our experts um, to come up with solutions. And I think I just hope for, and I imagine the sort of the greatest global movement where we're involved, everyone's involved, experts are coming together. Um, we're caring for each other like never before, fighting fake news, you know, fighting stigma, dispelling myths, um, and using technology and using our platforms to spread key messages um, to help our governments and, and to help our healthcare workers. So I really hope um, young people uh, in the audience to get today can take something from what I've mentioned and, and really, really get involved. So thank you, Lena. Thank you, Mariam. I'm actually going to keep this slide as we end this because there's no better message um, to end than this message of hope. And there is hope in youth. And thank you so much, Mariam, for leading this and um, being such a loud voice uh, on behalf of all the youth. I would like to thank everybody. Uh, this has been very enriching. It's a couple of hours, but I really hope that it's presented uh, very quality content from our participants, representing all perspectives. And I personally will definitely go back and watch it and, and reread some of these slides and resources and excellent examples from all of our speakers. I'm just gonna ask our speakers for one sentence from each, one message you would like to tell everybody before we end the call. Um, We'll go. Oksana, let's start with you. One sentence. Well, really just a call to action for uh, all of our audience to challenge 
uh, their professional associations about what they are doing uh, with uh, FIP and with wider groups on uh, ensuring that in their uh, national curriculums that this is mandatory uh, for uh, pharmacy students and for pharmacists to receive regular training and workshops on this. That's that, that education piece I cannot uh, advocate for enough, as well as echoing Miriam's um, call about in UCL Fight the Fakes, staff and students are working hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder uh, to fight the fakes. And we can't do it alone. We need to do, we need to work with the industry. Uh, Stan has highlighted all the excellent work uh, that they are currently doing. Uh, and we need to be uh, speaking with all of the stakeholders and challenging our own governments uh, to really recognize the problem and uh, enter this fight together. Thank you, Oksana. Stan, over to you. What's your message today? Falsified medicines harm and kill patients, and we have proved that through scientific means. We all know that, so first of all, let's keep that in mind. Um, patient safety is everyone's concern, especially on this call. Uh, I could say that of the general public, but we are all, to a certain extent, professional in, in the healthcare system. So it's everyone's responsibility at whatever level to, to try to do something about it. It doesn't have to be a lot. Could be just awareness, a bit capacity building. I mentioned about uh, policy advocacy. Could be just escalating incidents. You know, things you see on the markets, escalate them. A lot of questions I saw here on the chat were about what should I do if local authorities do not respond to our escalations? Who do I approach? So I responded to a few of these questions. But so it's everyone's concern. So feel part of it. Um, whatever you come up with, I'm sure that will be a good initiative to really try to do something against falsified medicines. So feel concern and do something, please. Thank you, Stan, for that warning. Really sobering and very, very true. It is everyone's concern. Thank you, Stan. Uh, Flandry, very quick message from you, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I may say that uh, the life of our population is on, on our hands. Let's keep working together to fight the fake medicines. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Flandry. It really is about saving lives. Miriam, again, back to you. Final uh, message uh, and voice of hope from you, please. Um, I think um, the, my message is simply just protect yourself um, and then protect others. Um, a lot of you are on the front line. Um, and I think sharing information, uh, sharing hope and kindness is also contagious. So um, let's just end with that note. And um, it's key, really, sharing information, um, the education piece that Oksana keeps talking about, um, it's key to save us from um, this parallel pandemic of um, SF medicines. Thank you, Miriam. And with this note, I would like to say thank you to the panelists, to all of our really engaged participants. We will get back to you to your questions. We are going to be thinking of a good plan to get back to you with that. Thank you so much, everyone, once again, and have a good day. Bye for now.